official to have people willing to step in last minute and help out. Even our tech team is gone today, but we've got some young guys in the back. Thanks for filling in on cameras and live stream. Uh, we want more people. We need more people in all of our teams. Uh, but if you have an interest in technology, um, sometimes our tech people are gone with Pathfinders or school, and uh, we need help in all areas. But let's have a word of prayer and uh, thank God for that home that awaits us. Loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful that someday uh, we will get to see you. When you break open the sky and wake up the sleeping saints, giving us all new bodies and taking us home to heaven, where the circle will never be broken ever again. We look forward to that, and we want to be there, and we want all our family and church family and friends, and we just want as many people there as possible. So touch our hearts through uh, these ancient words that still speak to us powerfully today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we turn to Acts chapter 18, uh, we, we turn there today to the passage that closes out the second of Paul's missionary journeys. Acts chapter 18, and we start today in verse 1. We've seen Paul through a lot of ups and downs already, haven't we? He's been through some crazy adventures, almost killed multiple times, uh, at least certainly once, left for dead, beaten horribly, jailed, imprisoned, persecuted, uh, but he keeps pressing forward. I look forward, and when we get to heaven, to meeting Paul and talking to him and learning more about his story. Acts chapter 18 and we start there in verse 1. And the Bible says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens, and he went to what city? Corinth. This is in modern-day Greece. Corinth was about 45 min uh, miles from Athens. And Corinth was on this narrow strip uh, of land leading to what they call an isthmus, uh, or he was on this land bridge. It's about four and a half miles across, and so it was uniquely positioned because there was a harbor on the, the southeastern side of this land bridge, and there was a harbor on the northwestern side of the land bridge. And so they got, they were in the center of this commerce. Anyone from the peninsula that wanted to go up to Greece had to go through Corinth. And if ships wanted to avoid this sometimes treacherous journey around the peninsula, they would take their goods to one harbor and then take it four and a half miles across the road that the Corinthians built by carts and put it onto another ship and continue their, um, their sails and, and transporting of goods um, back and forth. So they had all sorts of commerce in Corinth. Um, it was really located quite well, um, but Above and beyond the commerce and the trade that they did in Corinth, Corinth is known for being a very immoral city. It was a very wicked place. Um, if you think about you know, the stereotypical idea of Las Vegas having lots of being Sin City, the town of Corinth made Las Vegas look like um, a, a pretty upstanding town in many ways. Corinth was uh, not the best place for morals, not the place you want to raise your child. Um, in fact, in Greek, the phrase act like a Corinthian, it just meant to be sexually immoral. Uh, it was naturally associated. And when they would have Greek plays, and when there would be actors who would portray a Corinthian, they would always act drunk. That was just the stereotype about the Corinthians. And there was a phrase, a Corinthian companion, and that meant a prostitute. Uh, so this was just inbred in, and woven into the fabric of the society. The famous temple of Aphrodite, which was on top of the, the Corinthian Acrop Acropolis, this high fortified um, mountain that overlooks it. Uh, I was going to bring pictures, but we weren't able to display them today. So you can look it up later. Uh, fascinating place to look at 
But the temple of Aphrodite had a thousand so-called priestesses. And these priestesses would engage in very inappropriate things because they were not priestesses. Um, it was a very wicked and immoral city. So the Apostle Paul comes from Athens, where Athens was filled with idolatry and also wickedness. And now he comes to Corinth, and he's alone, and the city is just, it's just immorality everywhere. He could hardly walk down the streets without being solicited by prostitutes. And, and it was a very oppressive culture to try to live as a Christian and to try to be a missionary. The Bible tells us that in Athens, he felt very alone. His letter to the Thessalonians describes his time in Athens. He was lonely. He goes to Corinth. He's needing companionship. He's needing fellowship. And look at what the Bible says happens in verse 2. Remember what we said in children's story? God, if we're walking with him, he gives us what we need when we need it. Verse 2, Acts chapter 18, and he found a certain new Jew named what? Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, or Prisca in other places. By the way, Priscilla is mentioned more frequently in front of her husband. Uh, she was the more prominent one in Christian history. But they, they were people that Paul met early on in the town of Corinth. They had been expelled from Rome. The second half of verse 2 says, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Historically, it's interesting. There was a big commotion in the city, an uprising, a revolt, a, um, a lot of controversy in Rome. And one of the ancient historians, Suetonius, he writes that, that this was due to um, a character named Crestus. Probably this is referring to the name Christ. Not that Jesus was there, but that missionaries, excited converts to Christianity, had gone back to Rome after the day of Pentecost, before the, the Apostle Paul got there, 25 years before, and they had started to share the good news. And eventually, this led to conflict. And there was so much tumult and commotion in the city that Claudius, the emperor, had just expelled all Jews from Rome because the Romans didn't really differentiate between the Christians and the Jews because they shared so much in common. It just seemed like a, um, one sect within a larger group of religious people. So they were kicked out of Rome. Uh, and then that brought this husband and wife team there to Corinth. Paul came to them, the Bible says. Verse 3, and because they were of the same trade, he stayed with them and he worked. For by occupation, they were what? Tent makers. Um, tent makers. Paul, even though he was trained as a rabbi, he was... A tent maker. All rabbis were instructed to have their own trade that they could learn. In fact, it was commonly taught uh, among the people of his day, if you don't teach your child a trade, you teach him to be a thief. Right? In other words, if you don't teach your children how to earn a living, they're going to become thieves. So you better teach them how to do something. So Paul knew how to make tents. And probably at this point in time, he, he was a leather worker. Sometimes tents were made out of hair, of animals, and sometimes they were made out of leather. But Paul was able to carry around a small kit with him. He didn't have to carry tents or anything, didn't have to carry fabric. He could just purchase it in the towns that he went to. But he had his tools that he used for forming and cutting and sewing the leather into tents or into other goods. And so naturally he met up with these people because they had the same profession. And so he, he met them probably either in the synagogue um, or in the part of Corinth where tent making happened. So he's there and, and the Bible says in verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue how often? Every Sabbath. 
he continued his normal routine of going first to the synagogue and telling the people about Jesus. And notice he's saying, the Bible says he reasoned with them. He's using arguments and proof and demonstration from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Every Sabbath, persuading both Jews and Greeks. And then, this guy that had been lonely but now found friends with, with um, Aquila and Priscilla, now, verse 5 says, and Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Now his traveling companions, his ministry companions, they show up. And Paul was compelled by the Spirit, and he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But as happened in other cities, look at what happens in verse 6. He starts proclaiming freely who Jesus is, and opposition shows up. When they opposed him and blasphemed. Not just saying, I respectfully disagree with your position. But taking the name of Jesus and the things that he was saying, and saying horrible things about Jesus. Horrible things that ought never to be said. Doing these sorts of things, the scene gets more intense. And so Paul eventually just takes his garments and he shakes them, almost like Jesus telling his disciples just to kick the dust off your sandals if people don't receive you. Kind of ridding himself of responsibility, saying, I've done what I can do here, and now it's up to you. And he said, upon, he said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. But you know, even in this, this is kind of some strong language. Even in this, Paul was hoping the people, his own people, would come to accept Jesus. Uh, Paul never became anti-Jew. He never became anti-Jew. He loved his heritage. He was proud of his heritage, and he wanted all Jew and Greek to come to accept Jesus that he had come to accept. So he leaves the synagogue, and notice where he goes. Verse 7. And from there he departed and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was where? It was next door to the synagogue. He's like, well, if I can't preach here, I'm going to go right next door. It'll be easy for the people who want to hear me to come straight next door. And he sets up his own revival seminar, his own evangelistic series right next door, and he continues the work. And the Bible says in verse 8 that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, what happened to him? He believed on the Lord with his household, all of his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, knowing the pattern from previous missionary experiences elsewhere, when things are going well, what tends to happen to Paul and his companions? Something starts to go wrong, right? I don't know if you've noticed this in your own life. You're trying to follow God, you're trying to serve him, you're trying to make good decisions, and then what happens in your life? Turmoil, problems, things pop up. Why does it happen? It's because the devil hates it when we're trying to make good choices. He hates it. Now we could ask, well, why doesn't God stop all of the problems from happening to us? Uh, and he could, I suppose. Uh, maybe another question to ask is, what has God stopped that hasn't happened, that we never knew about? We always say, well, why, God, why are you doing this to me? It, but we have no idea what God has already stopped. And just like I was explaining with Emmeline, sometimes there are things that she doesn't want that she needs. Uh, she doesn't always want her diaper changed. Right? Doesn't always want it, but does she need it? Amen. Yes, she does. <laughs> right? Definitely needs it. We won't go into all the, the problem of suffering today, but sometimes there are struggles that we need. We don't want them, but sometimes God allows them because we need them. If you want to build muscles, you don't build muscles by lifting weights that require no muscle. You put on weight 
that causes you to struggle. Now, it's not as simple as I'm describing. There are more complexities. And this year, I'm going to do a sermon series on the problem of suffering and why is there suffering. And we're going to see there's a lot of angles to take a look at this. But sometimes we need. Um, Why did God create Adam first and let him sense that he was alone and had nobody with him? Why didn't he just create Adam and Eve at the same time? I think it was good for Adam to recognize, whoa, I'm lonely. God, I want you to, to make someone for me. He had a greater appreciation for Eve because of the way God did it. Sometimes people get into a rebound relationship. Have you heard of that before? You've seen it with your friends. They, they get so, through some horrible breakup, and then two weeks later, they're dating someone new. And you think, oh, that's not going to be good. Because they're not healed from the last relationship, right? Sometimes what you need is to be alone for a while. Paul experienced that loneliness, but at the right time, God brought him some some lifelong friends in in Priscilla and Aquila. He brought him back as companions. And now things are starting to go well. He got, got kicked out of the synagogue partly voluntarily, things are going well, but you have to wonder if he's starting to to sense that things may start to take a turn for the worse because he's right next to the synagogue. And the envy of those who didn't believe and didn't be persuaded is getting more and more intense as they see the people going not to the synagogue but to the house next door and people are worshiping there and accepting Jesus And so we see God showing up right on time with something that Paul didn't even ask for in the text, but but here we see in verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, and he said, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. Now, why would God say those things? Because Paul apparently was getting scared. And you can't blame him. I mean, if you'd been left for dead and had been imprisoned and beaten and and you knew the pattern, when there's a great work, then you got to flee town for your life. And he's getting scared. And when he needed it most, God showed up and he said, you're going to be okay. Keep on speaking. Isn't it often that It's fear that keeps us from speaking. We feel impressed to say something, a word of witness for Jesus, and we keep our mouth shut. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a difference between being annoying as a Christian and saying the right thing. There are some Christians who think, oh, I I am being bold and brave for Jesus. What they're really doing is they're being annoying and they're beating people over the head with the Bible and it's not helping. There's a difference. But the Holy Spirit can give us discernment, and he can give us the boldness that we need in the moment to share what needs to be shared, to say what God wants us to say. And so Paul receives this glorious vision. Don't be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you. Jesus speaking, I'm with you. You're going to be okay, and no one will attack you to hurt you. Notice that qualifier there. They won't attack you to hurt you. Won't necessarily be easy, but you're not going to get hurt in Corinth, Paul. He still had scars all over his body from the beatings and hurtings he'd received. Jesus says, I'm going to be with you, for I have many people in this city this city of wickedness and immorality. Paul, there's a lot of people here. Keep on talking, keep on speaking, keep on working, you're going to be okay. If you're working with the Lord, if you're on God's path, he'll give you what you need when you need it. We don't always get what we want, but God often gives us what we want, what we want also, but he certainly gives us what we need. And like Emmeline doesn't always understand what she needs, we don't always understand our need in the moment. 
but someday we will. And so notice the response, verse 11, and he continued there for how long? A year and a half teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So now it's starting. Paul has been assured you're going to be okay. I'm going to protect you. And now it starts like it started in other towns. Going to the civil authorities saying, this guy is doing bad things. Persecute him, hurt him, kill him, destroy him. But notice what happens. Verse 14, and when Paul was about to open his mouth, he's going to stand up there in front of the judgment seat and make his defense. Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason that I should bear with you. But if it is, not, if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. This secular Roman authority who spoke on behalf of Rome says, hey guys, this is a religious dispute amongst your own sect. Leave me out of this. Um, which is interesting because the significance of this was big. In Rome, there were legal religions and there were illegal religions. And if you were part of an illegal religion, you could be destroyed and killed by the state. But Judaism had been accepted as a legal religion. And so Gallio, who's, who was the older brother of, of Seneca, the philosopher, who was good buddies with Claudius, the emperor, Gallio is making a decision and he's saying, this is all one and the same. Don't trouble me with this. And so by, by proxy, he's actually saying Christianity is a legal religion. It's just a part of Judaism. Don't bother me with it. And so this decision actually, I think, was one that was helpful for allowing Christianity to continue on and not be shut down or immediately persecuted by the Roman authorities. God truly had protected and preserved Paul like he had promised. And he preserved and protected the early Christian church to, to allow it to, to grow and to thrive. And the result of this in verse 17 was, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. It's a little unclear why they were so upset at him, maybe for bringing this charge, and, and uh, maybe there was anti-Semitism that was involved. But interestingly enough, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, there is a fellow named Sosthenes, who is now a Christian. While it could be a different guy, it's very possible that this guy who had been the new ruler of the synagogue now eventually had become a Christian also. <coughs> God was protecting and preserving his people. Verse 18. So Paul remained a good while, a year and a half, the longest he ever spent in a city. While he was there, he wrote some letters. He wrote the letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to the people and believers that he had raised up in Thessalonica. And later on, by the way, did he write letters to the people of Corinth? He did. What are those letters called? 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And, and by the way, knowing a little bit about the story of Paul's missionary adventures in Corinth, will better help you understand when you read the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Did Paul have a lot to say about sexual immorality in those letters? He sure did. And with good reason, because the church lived in a culture that was saturated with it. The more we can understand the background of the cities and the places Paul was writing to, the better we can understand how it applies to our life. So Paul remained there a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila, his newfound friends, were with him. And he had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. This is kind of like a vow like the Nazarites would take. But what he was actually going to do is he was going back to Jerusalem. Um, and he, he cut his hair off, and he, 
collected his hair and saved it, and he was going to take it and put it underneath his sacrifice on the altar in Jerusalem and have it be burned up. He'd made a special vow, a special recommittal to God. Um, Paul was clearly not anti-Jewish. He embraced this culture and this heritage. And by the way, neither should we be anti-Jewish. Amen? We shouldn't be anti-anybody, but loving and accepting of all. Verse 19, and he came to Ephesus. We'll talk more about Ephesus later on. And he left there, but he, he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a longer time, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this feast, coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return to you again, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Previously, Paul had wanted to go to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit had stopped him saying, no, you can't go there. And now God says, it's okay to go there, but God had plans to bring him back later on, so he didn't spend a very long time. In our last verse for the day, it says, and when he landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch, thus concluding the second missionary journey of Paul. This afternoon, it'd be good for you to, to take a look at the map. If you have access to Google, just type into Google, map of Paul's second missionary journey. I would show it to you on the screen, but we're light on tech people today. And um, I didn't know we could have slides or not, so I didn't plan on it. But it's amazing to see the ground that he covered in his missionary journeys. And time and time again, Paul realized that God is able to provide for our needs when we need them most. It's not always what we want. We don't always understand what our needs are. But God, if we're working and walking with him, he will provide for our needs when we need them. I'm wondering what needs there are this morning in this church. Some of you are, uh, are carrying some heavy burdens. Some of you are dealing with fear uh, and, and difficulties that are unimaginable. This morning, we have a story that reminds us that we have a God who's able to help us. He's able to protect us and preserve us. And we may, like the Apostle Paul, go through some very difficult times, but our God is able to make all things right someday. There are some in the Bible, like John the Baptist, who thought he needed out of prison. He stayed in prison, and he died in prison. Uh, but he's going to get what he needs when God gives him a brand new body and is raised in the resurrection. Then there are others, like Paul, who was in prison. He wanted out, but he wanted to praise God above all things, and then God got him out miraculously. We have a God who's able to provide for our needs. You know, a number of years ago, I was praying, God, what do you want me to do this summer? I want to work for you this summer. I want, to, I want to use my summer for you. And I was praying and praying and getting nothing. I wasn't hearing anything back regarding what I should do. And that's strange because if you want to do something for God, God should tell you what to do. Month after month went by. It's getting closer and closer to summer. Nothing. And then finally, an opportunity arose. And it was something that, a program that didn't even exist in the months leading up to that point. It was not like in January or February I could have filled out an application to work in this certain job. No, the job didn't exist. But at the right time, when I needed it, when God knew that I needed it, he provided the answer that I needed. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't heart. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for providing in so many ways for us. Thank you for protecting us and preserving us in ways that we don't even know. Evil that Satan had intended to come our way and you blocked it. You preserved us. And while life is not always easy, we're thankful, Jesus, that you're with us. We're thankful that you provide for us, and at the right time, you will give us the answers that we need. And for that, we say thank you. And we also say, Lord, please give us strength 
strength while we wait, and help us to be the answer to someone's prayer today. Use us to be a source of comfort, encouragement, um, courage, or whatever, whatever else someone needs. Use us today to be that blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath.